So welcome everybody. Welcome to the fourth webinars of a series looking at how trade and investment policy can support a green transition for all. This specific webinar is titled Tariffs on Environmental Goods, a non-starter for developing countries' green transition. Uh, so I will be the moderator for this session today as uh, my colleague uh, Victoria called off sick, unfortunately. So I'm Leslie Sajou. I'm an international consultant at ITC Trade Facilitation and Policy for Business section, and I'm happy to moderate this session today. So let me now turn to Jean-Sébastien Roux, Senior Officer at the Trade Facilitation and Policy for Business section at ITC, for his opening remarks. Jean-Sébastien, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, a good day to everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to the International Trade Center webinar on tariffs on environmental goods, a non-starter for the developing countries' green transition, question mark. This is the fourth webinar of a series of events that ITC has been organizing on the role of trade and investment policies to facilitate the transition to the green economy. The United Nations Climate Change Conference COP27 closed last week with a package of decisions that reaffirm their commitment to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The package, also strengthen action by countries to cut greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the inevitable impact of climate change, as well as boosting the support of finance, technology, and capacity building needed by developing countries. Environmental goods, as well as services, might be avenues to make such political commitments a reality, including for developing countries. Indeed, their main purpose is to prevent or minimize pollution or natural resources depletion, to repair damage to air, water, biodiversity, landscapes, and to carry out activities such as measurements, monitoring and control, as well as R&D related to environmental protections and sustainability. Trade and investments, including at policy and regulatory levels, are keys to allow such goods and services to transit from one country to another. Various efforts have been taking place in different fora at multilateral, regional, and bilateral levels. There is a push to revive the talks of the WTO through the Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structure Discussion, TSD, almost 10 years after the start of the failed attempt of reaching an environmental goods agreement in Geneva. Countries have been more successful on the regional scene with APEC members agreeing to reduce tariff rates on the list of environmental goods back in 2012, as well as through more recent regional and bilateral trade agreements, tackling this issue through market access and to some extent tackling some of the non-tariff measures. Developing countries must find their way towards an inclusive and just green transitions. Accessing environmental goods and services on fair terms will be an avenue for them to acquire necessary technological and financial streams to embark on this green transition. However, so far, their participation in negotiations on the topic has been rather limited and their priority issues, which are mostly not related to tariff liberalization, seem to have been put on the back burner for now. In this context, this webinar will seek to derive attention to market access centric debates and shed light on other pressing concerns that developing countries are grappling with, such as NTMs. This will be done by one, taking stock of the developments at the multilateral and regional frameworks on environmental goods related negotiations and assess the scope of developing countries' engagement. Two, discussing impact of tariff and non-tariff measures on developing countries' trade in environmental goods and assessing necessary technology, accessing necessary technology to effectively integrate their into sustainable value chains. And three, assessing key priorities for developing countries on this topic and how to better bring such perspective 
into future negotiations and dialogues on environmental goods. Building on this webinar, ITC will also seek to organize further targeted dialogues and engagements on specific issues relating to the green transition and the role of various trade and investment policy tools in achieving this green shift with the objective of providing the necessary technical assistance for developing countries seeking to embark on these crucial reforms. Thanks to all the panelists and participants who have joined us today and looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Sébastien, for these very insightful opening remarks. And just some quick housekeeping rules to, to take note of before we go forward. We encourage participants to please send your questions via the Q&A tab. Uh, you can see it on the, on the bottom of your, of your screen. And we will address these questions during the panel discussion and the following dedicated Q&A session. And we encourage also the, the panelists to respond to these questions live on the Q&A session as they seem fit. And uh, just to note that this session is being recorded and we can make it available for the participants after a while. So um, now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Vidya Nathaniel to make a presentation to set the scene of environmental good negotiations so far. So Vidya is an associate program officer in the trade facilitation and policy for business section also at ITC and is supporting the implementation of trade related technical assistance projects in developing countries. She has also held positions as young professional at the WTO, an analyst and economic team leader at Verite Research, an interdisciplinary think tank based in Sri Lanka. So in Vidya's presentation, we'll seek to explain what has happened thus far in the environmental goods negotiations at the multilateral and regional levels, and briefly explore the issues that have been raised with the objectives of discerning those key learnings to keep in mind as we look to the future. Vidya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so I will share my screen. I think everyone can see it. Yes. Okay. Uh, great. So the idea of my session is essentially to set out the status, to understand what has happened thus far at the global and regional levels, and then set the stage for the eminent group of panelists that we have joining us today, who will explore how we can move forward to facilitate trade in environmental goods, and particularly bringing developing countries into this framework as well. I should note at the outset that this is an extremely complicated uh, issue and has had a long history, and I will not presume to be able to tackle all the complexities and technicalities of this topic, but rather just introduce some of the big questions that have come up over the course of this debate. Starting with setting the context. So the, the environmental goods and services trade negotiations commenced in 2001 under the, as part of the Doha development agenda with the objective of reducing or eliminating tariffs and non-tariff barriers on environmental goods and services. Now, the progress was deemed essential for trade and for the environment. In terms of trade, it provided importing countries with an opportunity to access more efficient, diverse, and less expensive goods, services, and technology, which can then facilitate this green transition. And for exporting countries, it meant new market opportunities, plus the potential to develop more globally competitive industries dedicated to environmental protection. And for the environment, improved access of countries to high quality environmental goods means better care for the environment, of course, increased energy efficiency, and you're building in these key environmental priorities into your development strategies, and thus contribute to long-term inclusive growth. So there have been various levels of efforts. We see multilateral negotiations that have taken place, plurilateral negotiations, and various regional mechanisms by way of regional agreements on this, plus provisions in regional trade agreements. We will, we will just explore some of this over the course of the next set of slides. Zooming into the WTO negotiations, starting with the multilateral efforts. There was the Committee on Trade and Environment, which was tasked with the um, task to identify environmental goods of interest. There were also discussions taken forward through the negotiating group on market access, as well as relating to environmental services in a special session of the Council on Trading Services. But there was limited progress on this front. Subsequently, um, an initiative was launched in 2014 by 14 participants 
to commence plurilateral negotiations for an environmental goods agreement with the idea of removing barriers on such goods. Now, this initiative increased to 18 participants representing 46 WTO members, and there were 18 rounds of negotiations exploring various issues. They looked at specific categories of goods that could be included in the list of environmental goods, um, reviewing this list and addressing other sensitivities. Um, the negotiations, however, were mainly restricted to goods. There was some consideration, but it was limited in terms of services and NTBs but no agreement was reached on this topic. And at the stage when the negotiations broke down, participants had not yet reached consensus on modalities for the functioning of the agreement, such as uh, how to revise the list, how to include new members and other such matters. Currently, there are also negotiations underway, well, not negotiations, but there are dialogues underway under the trade and environmental sustainability structure discussions, where certain members have noted their intentions to include matters relating to environmental goods. It will be interesting to see how this is taken up in this juncture, and uh, my fellow panelist, Carlos uh, Guevara, will explore this further in his presentation. Next, looking at, under, we try to understand at this point, why has this been so challenging? And what can we learn from what has happened in the past as we look to the future and seek to further strength, to strengthen this trade in environmental goods? Um, one issue was defining environmental goods. Now, to date, there is no universally agreed upon definition. There are various definitions. For instance, the OECD 1990 definition, 1999 definition. There's an APEC agreement uh, definition, which has defined there are 54 product categories, a definition by the EU. While there are some overlaps, it's not entirely the same. And you can see, and this itself shows that there are some divergent understandings of what environmental good constitutes. So it's very difficult to come to this uh, this is come to a you know commonly held understanding of this topic. Um, even in the plurilateral environmental goods negotiations, the definition of environmental goods formed the main crux of the negotiations. Participants exchanged lists that they considered acceptable to include in the final agreement, plus those they considered sensitive because, and therefore difficult to include for either trade or environmental reasons. At the outset, the list comprised of 400 level products, but as negotiations proceeded, this whittled down to about uh, to approximately 300 product lines, and yet no agreement was reached. So just to illustrate some of the issues in this regard, I mean, if you take, for instance, goods which have dual use, dual purposes, how do you then define what whether this is an environmental good or not? Take, for example, concrete. This is an integral element of carbon neutral building, but still has negative effects on the environment. So then do you classify it as an environmental good or not? Wood is deemed to be good for the environment in, compar in comparison to other building material that is used. But then deforestation is an increasingly charged topic in many countries. And there are national strategies to protect forests and prevent deforestation, rehabilitate forests. So then how do you reconcile these varying viewpoints? How do you then consider what constitutes a good? Um, and this difficulty in terms of defining the environmental good also led to challenges in terms of how you would implement this agreement. Now, the negotiation centered around categories of goods as um, defined by the World Customs Organization's HS codes at the six digit level. And this is the case with all WTO tariff negotiations as I understand. But the issue was, whether the scope would then be too broad of what constituted an environmental good. So take, for example, the case of mufflers. These are used in wind turbines to reduce noise. Wind turbines are clearly an environmental good, but then they can also be used to reduce noise in airplanes, which do not necessarily fit this definition. So then negotiators were confronted with, do we liberalize trading products covered under the relevant subheading? and accept that the product may be used for other purposes than the intended environmental objective, or they could use excels to narrow down the specific characteristics of the product used for the environmental purposes. So if you take mufflers, they would then specify mufflers which are used in the production of wind turbines, not airplanes. And this has been used in the APEC list. Uh, Carlos, please feel to correct me later on if I'm wrong. But um, the issue is then negotiators will have to contend with the possibility that there might be long lists of exouts. And this would then require higher levels of administrative complexity and transaction costs. Um, the other issue was, well, the lack of issues covered. 
Um, the negotiations mainly focused on tariff on goods. There was a limited consideration of services and non-tariff barriers, and this was identified as a concern by many reports. Um, and non-tariff barriers are a significant challenge for developing countries. Um, if, for instance, you take um, minimum energy performance standards or mandatory or voluntary labeling. Now, these are important as they inform the buyer about the environmental impacts of good and therefore can reduce environmental damage. But the standards may vary greatly across countries and therefore there's costs associated with conformity measures, which can then become a trade restricted measure. So if this was not addressed, if this was not considered seriously, or there was not much attention being placed on this, then it would be a barrier, it will be already a barrier for de developing countries to engage in these negotiations. Um, this is not to say that it was completely cut out of the negotiations. There were some discussions on the possibility of establishing a work program, but limited progress was made on this front. Another issue is environmental services. Now, services comes with its own list of challenges, but the, some of the arguments made in the reports were that environmental services and goods are inextricably linked. And so a lack of consideration of services in the negotiations may make it more challenging to liberalize environmental trade. And then finally, um, in terms of the scope of participation, at these negotiations. It was mainly limited to the high income countries. From the developing countries, it was mainly China, Costa Rica, and eventually Turkey. Um, there was no African countries participate, there were no African countries participating. And from the developing world, um, the biggest developing countries such as India and Brazil were not part to these negotiations as well. And this could be attributed to various reasons. One being the fact that the lists developed focused mainly on industrial products and most developing countries feel that they do not have well-developed markets for these products. So they would not expect to benefit much from having access to these markets. And in any case, tariffs were already low for these products by lower MFN tariff rates, plus the preferential market access that they have. Uh, my colleagues, Carlos and Joachim may expand on this a bit further in their presentations. Uh, the other issue was the issue of NTBs. Um, so even if the product list was expanded to cover agricultural products, for instance, which developing countries have a comparative advantage in, there will be issues coming up in terms of labeling, certification standards requirements, which could become barriers. So there needed to be serious consideration of these issues. Plus, the other issue was developed markets already employ very stringent environmental policies. And developing countries still need time to first develop their environmental regulations and the production capabilities in environmental goods to be able to penetrate these high income countries. So there was still a lot of groundwork that the developing countries had to do in this regard. Um, but it is interesting to note that there has been more progress made on the regional front. So then we question, uh, the question is, what can we learn from the progress they have made and see how we can take this forward? Take, for example, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, uh, which is probably what the well, most well-known agreement, which came into force in 2012, covering 54 environmental goods, where member states agree to apply tariff rates of 5% or less on these goods on a voluntary basis. As of 2021, 19 APEC members were deemed to be fully compliant, and this includes developing countries. And there are efforts underway to expand this agreement. Uh, Carlos will explain further during his slides his procession. Um, there is the recently concluded agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability with six participating countries, uh, New Zealand, Fiji, Costa Rica, Norway, Switzerland, um, with efforts to also expand this uh, to other WTO members. The agreement covers removing tariffs on goods, but also commitments on services and guidelines on voluntary eco-labeling programs and mechanisms in this regard. Other RTAs, uh, which uh, Mahesh will expand upon in his session, have also made more progress in this. So take, for example, the case of the agreement between New Zealand and Chinese Taipei, which covers goods, services, as well as has mechanisms to address, um, provides for initiatives to address non-tariff barriers that impede trades in environmental, trade in environmental goods and services. Uh, just looking at the other trade agreements, uh, they have provisions on liberalizing goods and services that recognize the importance of trade and investment, look towards addressing NTBs, as well as bringing awareness and education programs for uh, facilitating such trade. So um, to conclude this presentation,
information, I will leave with a few questions that I hope we can discuss in the next sessions our panelists will explore. The question is, what can we learn from the initiatives undertaken thus far? And how can we ensure that developing countries are not left behind, but actually become an active partner in the transition to green trade? And in this context, what issues do we need to prioritize to reflect the needs and concerns of developing countries in relation to trade in environmental goods and services? Plus, what is the most suitable forum or space in which to make progress on these pertinent issues? With that, I will hand over to Leslie. Thank you Thank very you much, Lydia, for that yeah. comprehensive insight into the negotiation that have been taking place at various levels and giving us a snapshot of the challenges faced by developing countries in engaging in the discussion still today. So now it's time to deep dive into some of the technicalities and the rationale that have driven the negotiations on environmental goods so far and assess their relevance from a developing country perspective. So I'm very pleased to introduce our next two experts that have kindly accepted to join our panel today. Both will help us in assessing the real impacts of tariffs on trade in environmental goods, exploring the significance of non-tariff measures in facilitating such trade, and how those tariff and non-tariff measures might affect developing countries in effectively engage in environmental goods and services trade. So first, let me give the floor to Carlos Kuriyama. Carlos is a senior analyst at the APEC Secretariat Policy Support Unit and is supporting trade and investment liberalization, regulatory and structural reform. He will soon be leading the APEC Policy Support Unit, so congratulations on that, Carlos. And previously, he served as a governmental official at Peru's Ministry of Foreign Trade and Tourism, where he was engaged in the Peru-China FTA negotiation and the Peru-Singapore FTA negotiation between others. So, Carlos, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning to all of you in, in Geneva. Thank you so much, uh, Leslie, for your kind introduction. Uh, my thanks to the ITC for the kind invitation to, to talk about this, this topic of environmental goods, in particular about the, the priorities that uh, developing economies I mean, need to take into account I mean, in this sort of uh, uh, processes. And, and I would like to do it by illustrating some experiences in APEC. So for some of you that uh, might not be familiar about APEC, we are the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Uh, it's 21 economies. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to seek to achieve uh, sustainable growth and, and, and inclusive development and a stronger Asia Pacific uh, sense of Asia Pacific community. And we would like to do it through initiatives that are pursuing free open, non-discriminatory, transparent trade and investment uh, as well. So that's a, that, that's a brief introduction about what APEC is. Uh, let, let me share with you uh, some slides that I have prepared for this, this occasion. Uh, I'll put this in slide show. So in terms of the environment, I think Carlos might have a problem with his connection. Carlos, can you hear us? Okay. So maybe we can leave him a few minutes to reconnect. Carlos. Maybe uh, just for the sake of time, we might ask um, Joachim to go forward with his presentation while we try to get hands on uh, on Carlos, if it's okay for you, Joachim. So Joachim is a climate trade lead at the World Economic Forum and focusing focuses on strengthening the interlinkages between trade and climate change. Previously, he worked with organizations such as the Quaker United Nations Office, the UN Environment, the International Union for Conservation of the Nature, between others, and he was a team leader for several sustainability impact assessments of trade agreements for the EU Commission, uh, notably the Green Goods Initiatives and the EU Philippines FTA. So, Joachim, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for jumping in. 
Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. And uh, I must say there was really an excellent uh, overview and introduction, uh, Lydia. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Jorge Montalban and I'm the lead for uh, climate and uh, trade at the World Economic Forum. So that means that I'm working on diverse linkages between trade, climate change and uh, investment, uh, including a uh, focus on uh, climate goods and services and trade. So uh, we published a report in um, September of this year uh, that is called Accelerating Decarbonization Through Trade in Climate Goods and Services. So uh, if, if we have the bigger area of environmental goods and services, then um, uh, one specific area there, but actually a very big area of, of um, uh, environmental goods and services or EGS is actually related to climate goods and services. So we're talking here about uh, goods related to renewable energy, for example, uh, energy efficiency, uh, refrigerants actually are very important for um, addressing uh, climate change mitigation uh, and other relevant uh, technologies, including transport technologies, um, uh, insulation. So um, in this report, we identified 25 uh, categories of goods that can really help to decarbonize industry. And uh, it, it covers the, the items that I just mentioned, so like refrigerants, uh, wind power, efficient motors, very important. Uh, in some countries, half of the electricity uh, is, is used by motors. So if we can have simple things like uh, multiple drive, uh, speed drive uh, motors, then we could uh, save a lot of energy. Um, and um, we have a short list of relevant examples, also divided by the categories that are uh, identified by the IPCC, um, including transport, uh, construction, uh, and, and energy, um, as long as a longer list uh, that you suggest of, um, of inputs into those key technologies. And the longer list is a few hundred uh, goods. Uh, in, including uh, components that might be very interesting for uh, developing countries to, to produce uh, in order to, to work their way up the value chain. Um, so uh, the emphasis in, in our report is really um, uh, on, on non-tariff barriers and also uh, services. Uh, I will get back to that in a bit. Uh, just on services, I would like to say that actually the market for sustainable energy services in value terms is twice bigger than the market for the related goods. Uh, just we don't see the, the services, right? But if you buy, for example, uh, a wind park, there's a lot of services involved, like engineering services, construction services, financial services, legal services. Um, and often those goods and services are traded in tandem. So um, uh, the, it's, it's very unfortunate actually that uh, services related to sustainable energy are largely neglected both in national policy making and also in international uh, negotiations. Uh, th there's uh, very much of an emphasis always on manufacturing, whereas there's many more jobs, especially green jobs in, in the services sector. So uh, we are very grateful to uh, the, the stakeholders that helped us to, uh, to develop this report, stakeholders from industry, but also from uh, civil society, from international organizations, uh, experts, academics, that have all uh, given their inputs into this uh, report. And we launched, we launched this report during the Climate Week uh, in New York. Um, I think it's very important also to emphasize that uh, we take systemic and holistic approaches to both trade and investment in decarbonization, because often trade and investment, they, they really go together. And also here, it's very important for developing countries to uh, play their role in value chains, to facilitate uh, trade, to facilitate investment, um, because often it's a chicken and egg story, right? Um, developing countries could say that they don't have a relevant industry yet, especially in manufacturing for uh, renewable energy, for example. But if the right policies are not in place, then it it's also becomes more difficult to get that industry kickstarted. So uh, there's the example, of course, of Costa Rica, which didn't have much of a semiconductor or IT uh, industry uh, just 20, 30 years ago. They joined the, the information technology agreement, the ITA. And after that, they, they got quite some investment into the IT sector. Um, it, it was not always a plain right that they had, but now recently uh, the investment is back in, in Costa Rica in, in semiconductors, for example. 
So it, it also shows the need for a long-term uh, strategy, I think. Joachim, if just a one moment, I think the presentation froze on the first slide, so you may want to quit the screen sharing and reload it so that everyone can see your slides. Sure, I can do that. Yes, thank you. Um, now you see the next slide, right? Yes, it's working now. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Good. Um, so then in terms of the findings uh, of, of our report on uh, climate goods and services, um, we found that tariffs indeed are not super important because they have declined to about 2% on average and actually half a percent on average in developed economies. But some tariff peaks remain in, in some countries for some items. Um, and um, um, what, what uh, is important, though, is to look at the cumulative impact of, of tariffs. So often components, goods, they pass several um, uh, borders and all the tariffs, they add up. So this is why it's important also to take a systemic view of the supply chains. Um, then in terms of non-tariff barriers, um, we suggest eight categories of non-tariff barriers uh, covering areas like standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment procedures, local content requirements, uh, export measures, and restrictions on investment, etc. Um, and one example here is the classification that is needed and also standardization of green hydrogen. And where we currently see, on the one hand, a move to fragmentation to different standards, for example, for what uh, can be counted as green hydrogen. Um, but there's also very positive efforts going on to, to harmonize those different uh, standards. And it's important to, to put more emphasis and, and um, uh, energy into those uh, initiatives of standardization and harmonization. Um, as I said, we have a short and also a long list of suggested climate goods uh, that we have published on our website. Um, of course, you can contact me and I will be very happy to, to share both the report and, and the list of the goods with you. Um, and then what is very important for developing countries, of course, is a just and inclusive transition, uh, which also points to the importance of green jobs. Of course, there's the potential to create millions of, of green jobs, uh, but we need the right uh, policy frameworks to create those jobs uh, in, in the climate goods uh, and services sector. And there's the need for capacity building uh, to, to develop those uh, policy frameworks that enable investment and that enable trade in uh, climate goods and services. And what is very important for uh, developing countries is not just industrial goods, but also environmentally preferable uh, products. So those are products, for example, like uh, bamboo construction materials that are not in themselves typically counted as an environmental technology, but still that have substantive um, uh, environmental benefits. Um, so um, as the next steps, I think TSSD was mentioned, uh, Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structure Discussions at the WTO, where there's a working group indeed uh, on environmental goods and services. Uh, the environment on uh, climate change, trade and sustainability is it's, uh, under development. Uh, there's different FTAs. Uh, the FTA between Chinese Taipei and New Zealand was mentioned. The EU, of course, is very active in its uh, FTAs uh, to develop chapters on the trade and sustainability. And uh, APEC is moving forward uh, with its uh, work. Uh, Carlos was uh, starting to tell us uh, more about that. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing more from Carlos about plans from APEC uh, next year, when uh, also the US, of course, is hosting APEC. Uh, where some very uh, exciting uh, initiative might be uh, further developed. So with that, I, I will also leave with uh, two questions that I think are important in, in when we talk about EGS. First of all, how can we engage more governments and companies in championing uh, the report's uh, messages, but also um, in championing the, 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 the messages that the other panelists uh, might have today? And here, of course, the public-private cooperation is key. 
And the second question is, what is a good way to collect further anecdotes on green products and services trade challenges? Um, because often we talk about EGS in, in a very technical way, but these are really the, the goods and the services that give us clean air, that give us clean water, that give us clean energy, and, and that are uh, essential for, for life. So um, to, to have more uh, examples from practice uh, from specific countries and regions for specific technologies, I think that can really um, make this topic uh, come, come to light. Thank you very much. Uh, Leslie, I think you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. So I was saying thank you very much, Joachim, for sharing with us some of these main findings from the recent report published by WEF. Uh, we shall really invite the participants to read if they want to continue learning on this topic after the event. And again, um, I think it was made clear that for developing countries, there is a need to prioritize and strengthen the dialogues on tackling non buyers non-trade barriers, sorry, to be able to access relevant uh, climate goods, environmental goods and technologies, finances, to make the shift towards a, a green transition. So now I turn back to Carlos, who will give us like the APEC perspective, the more regional perspectives, and uh, we will share uh, the, your slide, Carlos. You can, you can go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. My, my apologies to everyone for this technical glitch on, on my side. And, and can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, the next slide basically show us, a, a, we, we have 54 goods comprising the APEC list of environmental goods. That's at the, using the HS nomenclature at the six digit level. And the objective of this list was to reduce tariffs affecting those goods to 5% or less by 2015. So most of the goods in the list are about management of solids, uh, hazardous waste, recycling systems. It's about goods related to renewable energy and also equipment that is helping us to do environmental, environmental monitoring analysis and assessments. Uh, we also have some, some goods related to air pollution control and, and natural uh, risk management, wastewater treatment, and potable water uh, uh, treatment as well. Uh, next, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, about this slide that you can see now, you can see that the, the global trade of goods in the APEC list has been growing uh, throughout the years, even though, I mean, we had a sort of a peak before the pandemic, it, it, it went down and now it's starting to recover again. So in, in 2021, the global trade of these 54 environmental goods uh, was around uh, $541 billion. So in monetary terms, it's a lot of money. And this list has been very relevant as the world trade growth of these 54 uh, environmental goods altogether was greater than the world trade growth of all the universe of products that also include non-environmental goods. So in other words, the trade of these environmental goods in the APEC list has expanded much faster than other goods. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, what, what are the reasons behind the, the expansion of, of trade of goods in the APEC list of environmental goods? There are several reasons. So the first one is that cost is going down. So environmental technologies are more affordable nowadays. The second reason is that it, there is a stronger environmental awareness. So a, a companies, people are using less polluting technologies and more environmentally friendly products. Also, another reason is about the traditional energy sources. Oil prices in particular, uh, they have been very unstable and there has been an upward trend in terms of oil prices in, in recent years particularly since the mid 2010s. Uh, another reason is that uh, many, many governments are implementing programs that are basically incentives for the development of alternative energy sources and energy efficient goods. Uh, and finally, uh, basically governments are implementing more government regulations to protect the environment 
Uh, and they require you know, the, the use of environmental goods and, and services. So these are some of the reasons. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide basically shows what's the average um, MFN tariff in each APEG economy regarding the APEG lease of environmental goods. So the average tariff you can see is very low, below 5% in most APEG members. So this is making it easier, cheaper to import these goods. And it's important also, uh, it's important here to know that uh, you can see two APEC members with an average above 5% in Indonesia and Chile. But this data basically is not reflecting a recent tariff reduction in Indonesia to fully implement the APEC, the commitments in the APEC list of environmental goods. In the case of Chile, Chile has a flat 6% uh, MFN tariff system, but Chile has implemented a broad range of trade, uh, uh, free trade agreements all over the world. Uh, and so if we take into account the FTAs that Chile has signed, the, the, the applied average tariff for Chile is very low, it's around 1%. So uh, we, 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 we can say that yes, the, uh, the tariff levels are, are very low. And now I think it's very important to have a look, not just at, to tariffs, but also to non-tariff measures. So next, next slide, please. So in the, in the case, next slide, please. So in, in the case of the uh, uh, non-tariff measures, uh, we are noticing an increase in their use in recent years. And in particular, those NDMs that are uh, uh, the represented restriction to trade. So this table basically shows the NTMs that are restriction to trade. So in other words, the NTVs and non-tariff barriers. Uh, this is data from the Global Trade Alert. And we notice that most of the non-tariff barriers are related to export-related measures, in particular export subsidies. In the case of the import-related measures, most of them are about subsidies too. So the, the impact of NTMs is uh, very significant. And, and actually now in, in APEC, we are conducting a study on NTMs in goods that are helping us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in this study, we are noticing that the export-related NTMs are affecting at least 207 million of APEC exports on these goods that help us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's very significant. Uh, next, next slide. So in negotiations, so besides tariff, it's important to have a look, I think, to the, the non-tariff barriers. And, and we also, when we talk about uh, market access, I think we need to have a look at how we could expand the, the scope of any, any lease. So in APEC, we are discussing the possible ways to expand the current APEC lease of environmental goods. And there are many advantages to do this exercise. It could benefit economies that are developing, also developing as well. And, and, and why is this? It's because there are benefits from the export and the imports and the import side. So, there will be better market access, but there will be also more accessibility to those goods. Also, uh, there are new goods that were not available back in 2012. So there are new products not in new technologies that are not, uh, those, those, those new products and technologies were not part of the release of environmental goods. Also, uh, it's important to include not just final goods, but also those goods along the global value chain of environmental goods. I think that could encourage the participation of uh, more developing economies in an active way, since they are producing many of the intermediate goods and many of these raw materials that are part of building an environmental, a final environmental group. Uh, another advantage is that many of the communities that are producing these goods within the global value chain of environmental goods could benefit. Uh, and and this uh, an expanded list could also promote the use of more products that could support uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation. And it could help uh, communities in terms of 
uh, having a better management of resources and also to assist them to have a better uh, implement uh, programs that are related to a better environmental protection and, and also fight environmental degradation. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about the, uh, the, the importance of the global value chain of environmental goods, so this is an example to illustrate the importance of pursuing a global value chain approach. Um, this is the case of the solar power industry. So you can see that many raw materials and components are needed to produce a solar panel or a solar, solar heliostat. So many of these raw materials and components are, are, are produced by developing economies. So uh, uh, there are many, many, not just tariffs, but also non-tariff measures that are affecting the global value chain of the solar power industry. For example, we have found out uh, measures that are uh, related to, to trade remedies, export restrictions, local content requirements, and, and subsidies. Next, next slide, please. A another example to, to show the, the complexity of the global value chain is about wind turbines. So there are around 8,000 different parts that could be needed to build the wind turbine. So that's why it's very important to, to have a a global value change chain approach. And, and next slide, please. So, and just to, to finalize, I, I would like to, 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 to show you some, some links about some recent work that we are doing in APEC and, and also tell you about some of the, the, the things that we are doing in APEC about environmental goods. So right now, as you know, the APEC list of environmental goods was agreed in 2012. So at the end, it was agreed in nomenclature uh, the, of the harmonized system 2012. Uh, last year, we finalized the transposition of these codes from the 2012 version to the 2017 version. And right now we are doing some work to conduct the transposition of the HS codes from 2017 to the 2022 version. We are also having discussions to explain Explore expanding the list of, of environmental goods. And to, for that, we, we have conducted a scoping study of possible new and emerging environmental goods that may be considered. So we have identified some, some goods like, for example, related to transportation, like electric vehicles, also products like a green hydrogen. And, uh, and so, I, I hope next year uh, we, 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 get, we can have some further discussions to see how we can we can expand this list. And, and finally, we are, we are conducting this project on non-tariff measures about trading goods reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So this project will probably be released by the first quarter uh, next year. So that, that's it from my side. And thanks so much for your attention and look forward to, to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for providing us with so many hands on information on how HAPEC members have tried to deal with both tariffs and non tariff measures to promote more trade in environmental goods in the region. And I'm sure that there will be plenty of questions for, for Carlos. So please do pop it in the QA tab. So before introducing you to our new two distinguished presenters, um, yes, I remember, uh, please do uh, send us any new questions in the Q&A tab, either to uh, particular presenters or to all of them. So it is no time to hear on the efforts that have been ongoing at plurilateral and regional level to strengthen more collaboration and trade opportunities in, in AGS. So um, Mr. Mahesh Shugatan will present on the regional trade agreements that can act as such incubators for cooperation on environmental goods, as well as more sustainable investment and more technology transfer. Then we will hear from Carlos Guevara and have kind of an insider perspective on how the WTO trade and environmental sustainability structure discussion can facilitate a more coordination on this issue and be a platform to address specific context and needs of developing countries. So first, uh, Mahesh uh, is an experienced professional with a demonstrated history of working in the international trade and development industry, 
He is currently based in the Forum on Trade, Environment, and the SDG test in Geneva, and he has been engaged in various works on international trade and investment policies, sustainable development, corporate social responsibility, as well as government and regulatory affairs. So, Mahesh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning to all of you. I'll just share my screen now. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, so thank you. Good morning again, and uh, thank you also to ITC for the for the kind invitation. And uh, I think that uh, the pre excellent presentations by uh, my colleagues, you know, Vidya, Jonathan, and Carlos have sort of set the stage uh, for the for my presentation, where I will be focusing a bit more on the relevance of RTAs and what lessons could be learned from the experience of RTAs for other initiatives in EGS. Now, uh, out of the 270 RTAs that have been notified to the GATT or the WTO, 129 agreements include provisions and commitments on environmental good services and technologies. Uh, also, after the, the setback at the multilateral level um, and, and the plurilateral level recently, RTAs have been the preferred avenue for many countries to undertake new liberalization commitments. I mean, in addition, RTS have also served as laboratories for innovation, incubation, and testing of these new ideas and approaches. Now, before I come to sort of more in more detail on some of these aspects, um, I would like to mention that in terms of the scope, so one of the, the big contributors that RTS have made is in terms of introducing various approaches uh, to, to looking at the scope of these goods. One thing, of course, to recall is that um, most RTAs uh, include liberalization across the board, which means that you know more than 90% of tariff lines or, or, or the majority of goods uh, that are being discussed uh, in by, by countries are on the table. So in that respect, maybe there is not perhaps a need that has been felt to define what exactly is an environmental good. And I would also argue the point that perhaps this approach has contributed in part to the speed at which RTAs can move, because obviously one of the factors that has stalled the progress of environmental goods negotiations at the multilateral level has been this issue of definition and you know what is an environmental good, what isn't an environmental good, what should we include and exclude. So a uh, comprehensive RTA approach sort of uh, jumps over that barrier by including everything on the table. Now that said, uh, RTAs have certainly singled out or emphasized what environmental goods are being liberalized in, in many cases. So for example, we have uh, the, the ANSTEC agreement between New Zealand and uh, Chinese Taipei, as well as the New Zealand-UK uh, free trade agreement that was, was concluded recently, where they actually have an annex which singles out the, the list of environmental goods that have been, uh, that have been uh, considered by the, by the RTA. In terms of environmental services, we have sort of two approaches taken. So one is more of a, of a positive list approach where you know, countries include those services that they want to liberalize. And in the other case, it's a negative list approach where everything is included except for those exceptions or the, the, sec the carve outs which countries might wish not to liberalize or exclude from liberalization commitments. Uh, and in terms of the Scope. So, for example, going back to the definition aspect again, I mean, the case of APEC, uh, one of the, the practical approaches that APEC took was really not to wait for the definition, but also to let every member include in the list what good it considered as environmental, including going beyond the six digit level and specifying X outs. And in certain cases, uh, countries also put negative X outs, which means that everything was liberalized except for the X out uh, that was included. So this could be some some useful lessons, perhaps to uh, to look at also at uh, you know in other initiatives. Now, in terms of uh, scope and coverage, one of the the, the good things with the RTA is that it has gone beyond a pure market access agenda. So there's been a lot of contribution in different areas, and one of them, for example, is on regulatory cooperation. So sectoral chapters in a number of RTAs, for example, include. 
uh, dealing with non-tariff barriers to trade and investment in specific sectors. For example, the EU Singapore FTA includes renewable energy as a sector, as well as the uh, you know, US MCA includes energy performance standards and test requirements. There is a chapter on organic products in the comprehensive partnership in the Pacific um, Trade Agreement, the CP, CP, CPTPP, uh, where there is a specific annex which, which includes uh, providing for mutual recognition of technical, you know, recognition or equivalence of technical regulations, standards, or conformity assessment procedures on organic products. Now, if the party does not accept as equivalent or recognize those technical regulations or standards for organic products, then the party would have can request that the other party can request the reasons as to why that was not considered, and and the the trading partner would have to provide those reasons. So so in a sense, it sort of facilitates uh, uh, the addressing of a lot of these NTBs on specific sectors of interest and organic products particularly is interesting because organic products was one of the categories that came up early on, if I recall correctly, in the Doha round. But because of other issues like process and production methods and so on, it wasn't considered. But this approach of having a specific sectoral chapter or sector annex or whatever on some of these products which might be of interest to developing countries, uh, you know, looking at the non-tariff barriers in the context of chapters might be an interesting approach to follow. Similarly, on renewable energy, as I mentioned, the EU-Singapore FTA provides for mutual acceptance of conformity assessment procedures. Uh, Carlos had mentioned subsidies in his presentation as one of the, the NTBs. Now, in terms of subsidies, an interesting example of how RTAs have dealt with it is the EU-Singapore FTA again, where Article 7.4, for example, prohibits has included disciplines on local content requirements. Uh, there's also, I, I believe the ACCTS is also looking at the issue of subsidies, particularly on fossil fuels, which in a way uh, would also constrain sort of the you know, uptake of, of renewable energy sources. Uh, the Caribbean community is interesting because the, the Caribbean community and common market provides for exclusion of remedial action against environmentally beneficial subsidies. Now, you may recall that in the WTO, there was formerly a category of non-actionable subsidies that had existed, but then which uh, lapsed and um, WTO members decided not to revive that. But then in the, in the RTA, we see that now there is this sort of exclusion, which, which could be considered, for example, there might be certain subsidies that are beneficial for environmental purposes for setting up certain environmental industries, you know, so that, that could be considered perhaps for a, for a time limited period for countries to enable um, you know, measures to promote their industries. So uh, there's also certain other areas that have been included like chemical substances, animal welfare. Um, there are also standalone chapters which have been included. For example, the EU Japan FTA provides for cooperation in the field of agriculture. Uh, EU Singapore FTA provides for standards in the, for the generation of energy from renewables. So there are a number of examples uh, of these sectoral annexes and chapters. Now, in terms of market opening, which I had already mentioned, um, the APEC uh, approach was to have a voluntary tariff reduction on environmental goods. And, and as Carlos mentioned, that country, the APEC economy is already uh, implementing that or have already implemented that. There have been provisions on exchange of information uh, on voluntary labeling schemes, for example, in the CTTP, the USMCA on energy performance standards. Now, from a developing country perspective, what is really interesting is the inclusion of technology transfer, capacity building, and technical assistance. So, for example, Article 9.3 of the Indonesia EFTA CEPA, the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, includes that the means of cooperation and capacity building may include grants, development funds, or other financial means. The Canada Peru Environmental Agreement, uh, which is a side agreement to the Canada Peru FTA, provides in Article 7.5b that the parties, the work program could be implemented through financial cooperation for priority projects that are presented by the parties. And they also, it also mentions that the resources could come from Australia, public entities or agencies from the parties or where appropriate from private institutions, foundations or international public organizations. So we see sort of this um, linking of the financial assistance uh, technical assistance and so on 
within the RTA, and maybe this could be perhaps a, a good template to consider for looking at specific technical assistance, capacity needs, uh, access technology needs in the field of environmental goods as well. You know, perhaps there could be some uh, countries that are interested in solar, some that may be interested in energy storage or wind, and perhaps there could be some provision to say, okay, well, I mean, if these are the priorities, you know, could we have like a chapter within the within a trade agreement that sort of looks at those, you know, considers those priorities and have some provisions. Now, uh, having said that, um, a lot of the clauses are in the nature of best endeavor provisions. So perhaps there could be room even within these RTAs to improve the, the binding nature of, of these uh, you know, provisions on, on technology transfer, capacity building and technical assistance. So, so there could be some, some improvements there too in terms of uh, the, the, the binding nature. Uh, so in terms of conclusion, I would say that the lessons from existing RP, RT experiences are relevant in four main areas. So first, RTAs have been at the forefront of determining what constitutes EGS. Secondly, many RTAs have gone beyond a pure market access agenda to incorporate EGS-related provisions on regulatory cooperation, government procurement, investment, and support measures, such as technology transfer, technical assistance, finance, and capacity building. Thirdly, they have RTAs have spearheaded the design of sectoral approaches to dealing with NTBs, focusing on particular environmental concerns. And finally, RTAs have explored a range of collaborative efforts that go beyond traditional WTO negotiated outcomes, including voluntary commitments, pledges, and best endeavor clauses. Uh, the final statement would be, I mean, we have to look at, uh, from, a from a developing country perspective, it is obvious that a lot of developing countries are players in environmental goods and services sector, as Carlos has also mentioned, particularly from the APEC region. But there are a whole lot of other developing countries that are still looking at ways to integrate themselves into global value chains on EGS, building their productive capacity in EGS, so uh, I would raise the issue point that perhaps EGS negotiations or initiatives in the future should look a bit more closely at the needs of these countries. You know, what are the broader needs in terms of access to financing, access to technologies, skills, training, regulatory frameworks, et cetera. And this is something that would go beyond the sort of traditional trade liberalization agenda or traditional trade negotiations or, you know, even, so there has to be a range of factors involved. I mean, it could, could be WTO, it could, you know, it would be organizations like ITC, UNCTAD, World Bank, uh, private sector. I mean, there's a whole series of actors that could be involved, but the, 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 these elements have to be looked at as part of a holistic package in addition to the, the market access uh, dimension of it. So I'd like to conclude there and uh, I'll open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. It was very enlightening to hear how especially the RTS have been exploring other forms of cooperations and types of commitments to promote fair and inclusive trade of EGS and uh, yeah, very enlightening. So now let me turn to Carlos Guevara, which is a career diplomat who entered the Ecuadorian French service in, 20, in 2006. Is currently working at the permanent mission of Ecuador to the WTO and has previously served at his country embassy in Japan. He has a bachelor's diploma in economics from the Ecuadorian National Polytechnic School and a master's degree in the same field from the University of Tsukuba in Japan. So during his career, Carlos has specialized in trade and trade related matters, working in both the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Foreign Trade. So Carlos, the floor is yours. We'll pass on the slide for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. And first of all, thank you for, for the invitation to speak in this webinar. Uh, I will focus my presentation on the informal working group on environmental goods and services. As many of you may know, Ecuador and Norway are the co-facilitators of uh, this working group. So I will let you know what, uh, uh, what we have done during this year, what are the, the landmarks that we have identified for, for this very complex topic, as you have already seen from, from the previous presenters. Um, next, please. So uh, as background information, the mandate of our informal working group comes from the ministerial statement on trade and environmental sustainability. In WTO, this is a TESSD um, initiative, 
and uh, specifically the language that refers to explore opportunities and possible approaches for promoting and facilitating trade in environmental goods and services to meet environmental and climate goals, including through addressing supply chain, technical and regulatory elements. Uh, currently, this uh, statement is uh, supported or co-sponsored by more than 70 WTO members. Next, please. Uh, in addition, uh, this year we launched our working plan for uh, 2022. As you may also know, uh, SD has four working groups and specifically in terms of environmental goods and services working groups, working group, we have three guiding questions for uh, our work. And these are how trade in environmental goods and services aid in achieving environment and climate goals. What are the opportunities, best practices and possible approaches for promoting and facilitating trade in EGS to meet environment and climate goals. And this is through, uh, can include uh, discussions uh, around addressing supply chain, technical and regulatory elements, access to climate friendly technologies, and uh, paying special attention to the issues uh, of interest to developing countries. Uh, the third question relates to what challenges and policies impede the ability of developing countries and LDCs to engage and maximize uh, benefits of trade in EGS and how these uh, challenges can be addressed. So uh, based on these uh, three guiding questions, we organize um, two meetings this year for uh, a working group. Next slide, please. Uh, these meetings were held in May and October, and this is in addition to two plenary meetings, two plenary sessions that we had in the context of the whole uh, initiative, TSD. The first meeting, uh, in our first meeting, we discussed about uh, priorities regarding objectives and, and sectors. And it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, in this occasion, we had a, a presentation from the International Renewable uh, Energy Agency. And in this presentation, they talk about the trade related challenges and opportunities for developing countries within the renewable energy sector to achieve environmental goals. Uh, during our second meeting, we focus on non tariff measures and, and services. And I would like to let you know that uh, how we came to the topic of the second meeting was based on the objectives and, and, and sectors and the priorities that were discussed in the, first, in the first meeting. We could identify a strong interest on non tariff measures, as you have heard today as well, uh, how important they are and, and how broad they are. So we understand that there is an interest on, on discussing this topic in, in more detail, as well as services. Uh, this was also something we heard from members uh, when we talk about EGS, probably there is a better uh, idea of environmental good, but in terms of services, we need to discuss a bit more. We need to, to analyze this topic better. So that's uh, how we came to uh, propose these two topics for the second meeting that we had in, in October. And during this meeting, we had an interesting presentation from Uruguay's national experience on, on renewable energy, how develop, they developed the whole, the whole sector and how they are updating um, the policies that they are, they are using and different strategies that uh, Uruguay has implemented. And also we heard about uh, APEC services experience, uh, which helped us also to to give some feed, uh, food for thought in, in terms of the future discussion we're aiming to, to have. Uh, we understand coming from the comments that uh, we have heard in these two meetings, uh, that there is an open space to focus this discussion on topics beyond market access and, and trade tariffs. As we have mentioned NTMs, we have also heard interest on regulatory frameworks, technology transfer, capacity building. Um, next, please. In terms of what we have uh, done this year, uh, participants have welcomed a stage approach. And, and this is uh, to discuss objectives and sectors sequentially. As a first example, um, and coming from the comments that we have heard from, from the members, we have chosen climate action as a first objective. And this includes uh, mitigation and adaptation, 
and as a sector renewable energy sector. And, and this is why we have had these presentations uh, in the previous, in the, in the meetings. What we are aiming to, to do through this uh, analysis and through this example is to have a common understanding of, of the discussion. As, as you know, different members have uh, different approaches to, to this topic, and we are trying to build a common base for this, for this discussion. It has been suggested that we can have, um, we could identify important goods that are relevant to this sector, specifically to the renewable sector, and how the sector contributes to achieving the, the climate, uh, the environmental goal. So this is more or less the base of, of the analysis of the exercise we, we are trying to do within this informal working group. We definitely understand that the levels of ambition vary widely. And just as an example of what we have heard during, of, during the meetings, there are different uh, interests coming from further building a common understanding of the challenges hindering the dissem dissemination of EGS. There is also an interest of designing a framework of, for negotiation in a view of a specific environmental objective or a specific challenge. Um, identifying an indicative list of trade-related bottlenecks and trade facilitation measures on critical products for climate action, interest on regulatory coherence and cooperation, transfer of technology and capacity building. Uh, there is a whole range of topics that, that where we understand there is an interest from members and we will try to uh, dig deeper on the elements that we have already covered in the previous meetings and also include others that are part of the work plan. For example, uh, technology transfer that we understand that is uh, uh, a specific and particular interest from developing countries. And coming to an end of this presentation, one of, of the big challenges we, we are facing is to get more engagement from developing countries and LDCs with the aim to understand better what the situation is, what, what is the approach. And um, at, at, uh, currently, we have uh, uh, done a lot of outreach with different with different uh, delegations in, in Geneva, and we see an, an increasing interest in this conversation. Uh, as you know, and it was very well explained in the beginning of, of this webinar, uh, environmental goods and services has a long history, and there were challenges faced before, and we're trying to understand them better and address them through the discussion within this informal working group. So this is what I can tell you today. And again, open to, to your questions and thank you, thank you for your invitation. Thank you, Carlos. It was uh, very great to hear from one of the focal points of the EGS focus group discussion and see how TESD is envisioning to tackle this issue in the months to come. So thank you very much. So I'm sure that after all of those very enriching presentations, you have a lot of questions or need for clarification or you might just want to, to share your perspectives and experience on the topic. So please do so uh, through the Q&A tab on the bottom panel. And um, I will start the Q&A and discussions with like reflecting on what has been said. And I think from the various presentation, it was made quite clear that at the moment, developing countries are not accessing the relevant uh, environmental goods and technologies to be able to engage in green trade. So it might be due to a limited interest on their part to create the market condition for such goods to come in. So let me turn to Joachim and from his experience in engaging with both the businesses and the government, why, why is this the case? And how do we incentivize the developing countries to make use of these goods and technology? Basically, what I want to ask from you is what is the business and economic case that can be created to facilitate developing country partners to engage more in, in environmental goods trade and those relevant discussions? Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, thank you, uh, Leslie. Um, I was actually at uh, COP27 in uh, Sharm el uh, two weeks ago uh, for one week. And um, it was very interesting because what you could clearly see is that the private sector uh, is really on board on, on climate action uh, and takes it very seriously. There's no uh, serious company left uh, that wants to be left behind on uh, taking uh, climate action. And that's just because it, uh, it makes economic sense. 
uh, it makes sense uh, in the current context of very volatile but also high energy prices. Um, and um, I think it also makes image uh, sense, of course. And we come more from um, from a time when uh, image was, was the most important. But we now see that it makes more and more economic sense to to um, to be sustainable. Um, and companies, of course, have made pledges towards um, net zero by 2030, by 2050. Um, but uh, all the, the question now at uh, COP27 was especially about how do we implement all those those nice pledges. Uh, and I think especially in terms of investment, uh, we are moving there, uh, location of capital. And it's very important there to see that 95% of uh, ESG investments, they stay actually in North America and in Europe. Whereas only 5% of ESG investment goes, goes to developing countries. So we need to look at how we can really facilitate uh, investment, especially to uh, developing countries uh, for climate action. And there's a number of measures uh, that we are working on uh, that, that can be taken, for example, by in, uh, investment promotion uh, agencies in developing countries. Um, and um, I, I think this investment space is, is at least as important as, as um as a trade space and, and the, the opportunity here for developing countries to go back to that is really to, to leapfrog, to leapfrog uh, a dirty but also expensive development space um, in which, uh, which is based on fossil fuels. And uh, if you look now at the cost of, of renewables in developing countries, uh, renewable energy is by far the cheapest. Um, so just really from a financial and economic point of view, um, the, the dirty development phase uh, based on fossil fuels doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, of course, not all industrial uh, processes can be run yet on electricity. So that's another question on how we can electrify everything and how we can use hydrogen for those industrial processes that cannot be um, electrified. So I will leave it there for now, but I think there's a whole range of opportunities for developing countries. Uh, to play a very constructive uh, role here, um, especially in, in their self-interest. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim, and thank you for also uh, giving your experience about the, the COP and how the climate and trade worlds are you know, trying to, to support each other to our more sustainable development and, and greener trade. So that's, that's quite encouraging. And let me now turn to Carlos Kuriyama. Um, I think, yes, signing on to agreement at the regional level is one step in this long process to, to facilitate trade in environmental goods. And this regional level commitment will then need to be translated into more uh, domestic uh, laws and policies. So, Carlos, from your own experience, how has HAPEC been able to guide and support its members? particularly the developing countries, to adapt and uh, adopt uh, the, their policy and regulatory frameworks to meet these regional commitments and strengthen their trade in environmental goods within the region. Uh, yeah, the, th thank you, Leslie. Uh, well, I, I think in terms of the, the, the one of the main, main challenges is basically the, the, the implement the domestic implementation is not an easy task. So to start with, when we talk about negotiations at any level, could be multilateral level, it could be bilateral or regional level. I would say the most difficult stage for any government is not the negotiation with the government counterpart, so with the other, the other governments. The, the toughest part is the negotiation with the domestic stakeholders. So that has to be handled in a, in a very delicate way. I mean, um, there's a lot of political economy there. They go, uh, issues that are related that pertain environmental matters uh, go across many different sectors. The decisions have to be cross-cutting and there has to be a lot of coordination among inside the, the government. So that's, that's, I think, very, 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 very tricky. So in, in, in APEC, I would say uh, it's been relatively easy to, to get, to, to get a, a, an agreement in comparison to, for example, WTO, because we are, we are fewer members. But also what, what we are doing a lot in APEC is to try to 
uh, share our experiences in terms of the implementation process. And so at the end, these lessons uh, could be adapted, I mean, to different realities within our, our, our membership. So that, that are some of the things that, that, that in APEG we are, we are trying to, 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 to push. Uh, uh, for example, now uh, uh, we just had the APEG Leaders Week in, uh, in, in Bangkok, uh, and we are launching a new initiative called the Bangkok Goals on the Biocircular Green, Green Economy. And in this initiative, uh, what we are trying to, to do is to have a, a get APEC members to have a further push in terms of uh, facilitating trade on environmental goods and environmental environmental services as well. Uh, it, it's very it, it it's very challenging the, the, the part related to the, the implementation, but I mean, a, a lot of, I mean, domestic work that requires public, good public sector governance is required for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. And um, let me now turn to the other Carlos, Carlos Guevara. Um, I think it was mentioned several times that export-related NTMs are a significant issue in relation to trading in environmental goods. And I wanted to ask, is there any other forum in which we can try to deal with this issue? For instance, is there a scope to address some of these constraints to the trade facilitation agreement at the WTO, for instance, or the TBT committee? Or can you think of other forums that we can uh, leverage to, to, to solve such, those issues? Sure, and, and thank you. I think that's that's a very interesting question. And it has uh, it has been raised in the discussions that, that we've had. Uh, import, I think it's important to, to recognize that what we are doing in, within TSD is, um, is a discussion. And we, if we want to implement some measures, we will have, or if we want to, you know, if we identify something that can, can be done, the easiest way will be to go to the committees that already exist uh, at WTO. And this was something that uh, some members already raised, if there isn't specific NTMs, taking into account that not all measures are barriers. That was also an interesting conversation that we had in, in the previous meeting. Not all these measures that are implemented has, have this intention, right? Some of these measures are actually focused on facilitating trade and they work. But some other measures within, you know, having a, a clear objective, have a, a negative impact. And, and those are the specific elements that we have, we have to analyze. But, but yes, we have already discussed about how, if there is a, a specific identification of a measure that can, be, that can be discussed, that can be addressed, the TBT committee will be the, the, the best option. And, and discussions are already uh, happening in this, in this committee with other topics. So that will be the, the, the committee that we could use or regarding trade facilitation measures. We can have a discussion in, in other committees, but this is very exploratory right now, since we, we have only had one meeting where we discuss NTMs, but certainly there, is, there, is, uh, uh, there are some, some other spaces that within WTO we, we could use. Great, thank you, Carlos. And I think I will use the question that uh, has been asked in the Q&A tab, to, I will read it first. So, how are countries assisting the SMEs to embark into this green transition, given the high cost of entry into making the green transition and the numerous barriers to venture into global trade and exporting? So, if you can reflect on these questions and also maybe how organizations such as ITC can support trade policymakers and MSMEs in those developing countries to craft domestic, regional, uh, plurilateral uh, trade policies and regulation that could promote a fair trade in environmental goods and, and services in the future. And, and using that opportunity as well to, to make some closing remarks on, on your side. Uh, to, so I don't know who wants to, to start. Um, maybe Mahesh, you want to, to start with that? Uh, yes, thank you, Leslie. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's a, it's a very important question. And I think it also sort of brings me to kind of some uh, few uh, concluding remarks that I would like to make. First is that uh, we would, I mean, it would be good to have a life cycle approach or a value chain approach for both goods and services. So it, depending on where developing country priorities and interests might lie. So for example, if it's a solar sector that we're looking at or wind or energy storage, uh, let's look at the whole value chain. Um, you know, Carlos had given an example of the solar supply chain. So let's look at goods, services, and components that would go into that. And what is required uh, for countries to build up at each stage of this value chain, or what could be some interesting segments of the value chain where countries could have an opportunity to build their industry, to build their competitiveness. Second thing is to look at the regulatory ecosystem, uh, looking at the domestic regulatory frameworks for the uptake of that sector, looking at the incentives in place, you know, uh, feed-in tariffs and things like that, uh, soft skills, uh, capacity for, you know, the, the labor force to participate in, in, in these sectors. And the third, which brings me to the, the question, is a financing ecosystem. So are there competitive sources of domestic financing available for these sectors, as well as international financing? Uh, what could be done to address those financing gaps? So one of the uh, points uh, that I, I, I remember recall from an earlier conference was this whole issue of risk and how private sector looks at risk in developing countries and can there be something done to de-risk those investments and or to leverage private sector investments? So if there is a fund which, for example, lowers the cost of risk of investing in solar or wind in developing countries, maybe that could provide a Kickstarter to, to the investment flowing in. And um, finally, uh, and then looking at sort of how trade and trade policy would contribute to all of these different segments. I mean, trade and trade policy and organizations like WTO and ITC, I mean, they all have their distinct roles to play. Uh, ITC, for example, I'm sure could be very helpful in getting those green industries, you know, helping some of those competitiveness uh, related uh, sectors, say SMEs in some of these green uh, supply chains as well. But everything works like a sort of an ecosystem in which, you know, I would, trade organizations play their role, but they can't play the whole role. So there has to be sort of a synchronization, like a, it's like a clock or a watch, you know, that all the parts have to work in synchronization. So I would say that that synchronization could be better improved in the, in the international system along all this. Thank you. Definitely, synchronization would be key, <laughs> as well in Switzerland, related to the clock thing. I think it's right. quite, quite nicely done. So now, uh, maybe Carlos Kuriyama, you want to go forward with that, that question? Yeah. And... Thank, thank you, thank you, Leslie. I, I think, uh, well, green, green transition definitely is important, but it's, it's not cheap. I mean, it has a cost. Uh, and, it affects mostly, I would say, as uh, SMEs, as you correctly pointed out. So the, the issue of, of funding, as Pahesh mentioned, is, is very, very important. There are other ways that also uh, governments could support, for example, through tax, tax rebates, certain types of, of subsidies, among others. They could also uh, implement uh, what I call the, the re regulatory tiring schemes in a way that SMEs could have, for example, differentiated timelines to implement uh, environmental regulation, noting the, 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 the cost that it represents to, to them in relative terms in comparison to, to larger firms. Uh, those, those are some of, of the, the, the ways that we, we, we could I mean, governments could, could, could help, I mean, to, to uh, SMEs to go into this green transition. And, and of course, I think uh, it would be good, uh, I agree again with what Mahesh mentioned, that it's important to, to, to go and uh, look at the environmental goods uh, with a global value chain lens. Uh, in that way, it's going to be easier for SMEs to participate in the whole global value chain and then reap the benefits of initiatives that are gonna, gonna, going to include uh, environmental goods. So I think those are some of the ideas that uh, I would like to share with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. And maybe in one minute, uh, Joachim, you want uh, to take uh, yes, a few points. First of all, I think it's very important to understand the concerns of, of SMEs. Um, 
So it's important to listen to them and to understand their concerns. Secondly, uh, SMEs, they cannot follow the WTO and their international uh, negotiations. Uh, so um, they, they need access to strategic information uh, on, on where things are going and what opportunities are. Uh, they also need matchmaking uh, to, with, with um, um, companies that are active in value chains to find their place in those value chains. On investment, uh, two uh, words are key there, two terms, uh, risk and uh, leverage. Often SMEs are too risky to invest in, and uh, also it's very important to leverage um, existing investment, public investment, in order to attract more private investment into SMEs, and um, also to bundle risks uh, to operate uh, to offer it, um, uh, the coverage of um, currency risks, uh, R&D risks, there's a lot of risks involved in investing in, in SMEs. Uh, and, and then finally, I think it's really important to mainstream all the issues that we discussed uh, today, to mainstream uh, sustainability and climate change in the WTO in different committees, including investment for development and negotiations, uh, trade facilitation uh, talks and other committees in the WTO, but also to mainstream um, sustainability and climate in the overall business environment for SMEs. Uh, SMEs face a lot of uh, red tape um, and, and uh, bureaucracy. Uh, and and uh, if we improve the overall business environment for SMEs, I think that will really lift all boats and uh, help them to participate and play a very constructive role in, in climate action. Thank you. It was a great webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, Akin. So I know the three keywords, risk, leverage, and mainstream. So now, Carlos, if you want to use the last one minute to make your closing remark. Uh, yes, I will be quite uh, brief, actually. And I, I don't have a, a specific answer about this uh, misplaced, but I will say that from the WTO perspective and what delegations are very much invested is in making sure that all the measures they've designed and implemented within a uh, uh, green transition are WTO consistent. And that is, an, that is an ongoing discussion. So I think that's a very important element that we have, we have to consider, and especially try to avoid unintended negative impacts of these, of these measures and taking into account the different partic particularities from developing countries and LDCs. Uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a key element. And trying to understand uh, or trying to make a contribution from the, the Miss Miss uh, perspective, I think, and as a whole, we, we have a need of a deep understanding of what this transition uh, means and, and what this implies and what, what are the actions that, uh, that need to be implemented. And with that in mind, uh, we need to decide what is the technical assistance and capacity building that is needed and the technology transfer that is needed. So I think it is important to, to make this, this previous analysis first uh, before going to, to the implementation or the, uh, the specific, specific actions. And just quickly, I saw a question about subgroups uh, regarding developing countries. I will say that we are not in that stage yet. We are uh, at this at this point. We are having we are trying to get more feedback from developing countries and LDCs within the formal working group. And as the conversation evolves, we will see what what format suits better. Thank you very much, and thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much, Carlos. So I want to thank you, all of you, who took the time to join us today for this webinar. And please do fill the feedback form, which has been put in the, in the chat box. It's a very quick questionnaire, and it will be extremely helpful for us in crafting uh, future useful events for you and our other beneficiaries. And of course, a special thanks to all our panelists who delivered very insightful presentations and to those who asked questions, participated so actively in this event. Have a good rest of the day and hopefully we'll see each other in other webinars or events in the future. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Have a good day.